Um, and most importantly, think about how we can translate these into clinical practice, because currently there's a there's a really big gap between what we understand about mental health problems and actually what people receive in frontline services. And we're always really keen for people to get involved in our research, and that can be people with lived experience of mental health problems, uh, it could be clinicians, other academics. Um, and we have something called Spectrum Connect, which is a way of keeping in contact with people who are interested in our research. So if you want to um, get involved in that, please visit the website. OK, so just before I start, I just want to um, acknowledge all the contributors to the work that I'm going to talk about. Um, so Catherine Taylor actually conducted um, all of the interviews for the, um, the research that I'm going to describe. And I think she's online as well. So um, you'll be able to ask her some questions and, and um, direct some comments to her too. Um, Craig Murray and Steve Jones, who I think is also online, um, are collaborators at the University of Lancaster. Um, and I also obviously want to acknowledge the contribution of the participants. So just to give you an overview, um, I guess the argument I'm going to try and make is that currently people are painting a very negative picture of bipolar disorder at the point at which they're given this diagnosis. And this is certainly true in the UK, um, and I'm guessing it's true in other countries, but maybe with this international audience, it's one of the things that we'd be able to have a think about. Um, and to really think about what the impact of that negative picture might be, um, and to make the argument that actually just that picture itself may have a negative impact on outcome, and it actually might be inaccurate, because it's based on quite biased evidence. And consequently, if we can actually explore in more detail the positive aspects of bipolar disorder, we might be able to achieve a more balanced perspective, so maybe paint a more balanced picture at the time of diagnosis. OK, so let's just have a think about um, bipolar disorder as a psychiatric diagnosis. The kind of message that people tend to receive when they, when they get this label in clinical services is um, that they have a mental illness. Um, and the implication is that this is a long term, in fact, forever, because a lot of people can technically be out of episode. The label is something that stays with them for the rest of their lives. The, you're also um, told that this it's characterized by periods of very extreme high and very low mood. And that you'll need to take medication to control this. And actually, this is a long term medication that needs to be taken even during phases where, where you feel fine. Um, and actually, it has some very nasty side effects. So looking at our NHS.UK website, um, there's a very, very long list, including really quite severe side effects. The literature um, that people get directed to suggests that it's a long-term condition that's likely to get worse over time rather than better, um, and actually is associated with quite poor functional outcomes. So, for example, 40 to 60 percent of people are not in work for two years or more, and generally the picture is that it's going to have a pretty devastating effect on your life. So, bipolar disorder is associated with the highest levels of divorce and suicide of all psychiatric diagnoses. So, I guess it's worth thinking about for an individual, usually a young adult, who receives this diagnosis and maybe goes and does a little bit of research about what it means. This is the kind of picture that's likely to get painted both by clinicians and by the literature that they come across. And what we wanted to think about really was you know, whether actually this message could have be, actually become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So in effect, you know, this very negative message, if we think about how it's likely to make somebody feel and how it's likely to make somebody react, um, I suspect that it would lead to feelings of hopelessness, maybe making people feeling very defeated, and consequently making them withdraw from challenging events in their lives, from goals, and, and effectively to give up on many of their life goals, which kind of leaves them with a sense of failure. So I'm thinking about things like dropping out of university, maybe being told not to go for very stressful jobs, but maybe aim a bit lower. And in, in a sense, this sense of failure can actually reinforce the negative message and, and lead to this um, picture of bipolar disorder as something associated with poor outcomes. 
So I guess it's really important that we, we ask ourselves whether this message is actually correct. Because what if this message is wrong? Well, first of all, the message is based on evidence from people who are long-term users of mental health services. So most of the research has, do has been done with people who have been in mental health services and stayed in mental health services over long periods of time. And we know that actually this is quite a biased group of people. Approximately half of people who, who meet criteria for bipolar disorder are not in mental health services. And even those that are have a more balanced perspective than this message would suggest. So um, this is a quote from Kay Jamieson, who's one of the, the leading researchers in this area, who herself has a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. And she, she comments that I've often asked myself whether given the choice, I would choose to have manic depressive illness. Strangely enough, I think I would. So there's something here that, that um, we need to understand in a bit more detail. We also know that the outcome for many people can be very good. And actually, if we sampled more broadly, we would get a much better picture of what this might look like. And there was a really interesting study that was carried out by um, an organization called Equilibrium back in 2007. And they did a large survey in which they asked over 3,000 people um, who have had bipolar, um, if they could press a button to get rid of their bipolar disorder, would they press it? And what they showed was that 50% of people said that they would press the button, um, but that meant that 46% of people wouldn't get rid of their, their bipolar disorder. So I guess we've got to ask, what is it that they, they are hanging on to? So if the message that we've just outlined previously is correct, why are people not really jumping to press this button? So how can we find out more about this? Well, I think there's a number of things that we need to do. And the first is to learn more about both the positives and the negatives of bipolar experiences. So ask people, what is it that, that they value? And that's actually what I'm going to talk about, um, the study that we, that we did at Spectrum. But I think some of the other things that we need to think about are broadening out our research to include people outside of mental health services and focusing on a wide range of outcomes. So while it might be true that people have repeated episodes um, of mood difficulties. I think thinking about broader, um, more functional outcomes such as recovery um, is a really important direction to go in. Um, and this link will just take you to um, a questionnaire that's that's been developed looking at recovery and bipolar disorder, and which was developed by Steve Jones. So if anybody wants to have a look at that, then hopefully if you click on that link, it will work. And we also need to think about how we provide a more balanced perspective to people at diagnosis. Because actually, if we can do this, um, this alone may be a simple but very powerful way to improve outcomes for people. So, for example, if we were able to give a balanced message, maybe we can turn the self-fulfilling prophecy into a recovery prophecy. So giving people a sense that they, they may still be able to go on and lead, and lead very um, fruitful lives um, to, if they can learn how to manage their mood episodes could give people a sense of hope and a sense of self-efficacy. They might learn how to self-manage mood um, and, and this in itself would, would lead to experiences of success um, which then reinforce the balanced message and they get caught in this more virtuous cycle. So, what do we already know about the positives? Um, well, there was a very helpful review of the literature that was completed in 2010. And what the, the authors of this concluded was that there was evidence that people with bipolar reported enhanced levels of spirituality, empathy, creativity, realism, and resilience. But actually, when we looked in detail at the paper, it actually showed just how little research there was on the positive aspects of bipolar. Kay Jameson, back in 1980, also identified five key areas in which people with bipolar disorder identified positives. So they were sensitivity and alertness, productivity, social outgoingness, sexual enjoyment, and creativity. But, but actually, these had all come from the researchers um, thinking about what, what people might endorse and presenting them with a list and asking them if they agreed with them. So they weren't generated by the participants. Um, a group of researchers at Manchester uh, identified people with only hypermanic experiences. So these were people who didn't suffer from depression and hadn't experienced severe, severe mania. 
Um, and they actually described these hypomanic experiences as being a very positive and controllable state that they um, felt was a very positive thing both for themselves and for other people in their lives and, and did not cause any problems. And the kind of things that they talked about was that um, their hypermania made them more social, more self-confident, more attractive to others and more able to, to do more things. Um, I guess in bipolar it's very rare that people will just experience um, hypermanic episodes because obviously to get the diagnosis they, they need to have had the other mood experiences. Um, but it looks like if you can have just hypermania, then it's it's um, a good thing for you. Um, and then, so moving on, um, this idea that th there's a very popular idea in the, the press and the media that um, mental health problems, in particular bipolar, is, like, is related to creativity. Um, and there was a, another review that was done by, Craig, uh, by Greg Murray and um, Sherry Johnson in 2010, where they, they searched for elevated creativity and accomplishment in people with bipolar. And what they found was evidence that this was present in hypermania, but actually once people reached full-blown mania, there was an interference with this process and there was less evidence that this was associated with creative experiences. Um, and then finally, Erin Mikulak um, had carried out a qualitative study on the impact of bipolar disorder on quality of life. Um, and although this wasn't focused specifically on positives, people did identify that their bipolar experience has opened up new doors of opportunity for them. So even when not specifically asked, it, it does get raised in more um, broader questions. Okay, so the study that um, that we carried out at, at Lancaster is published in the Journal of Affective Disorders, if people want to read it in more details. But just to give you a, um, a summary, um, we, we explicitly wanted to ask about the positive experiences of bipolar disorder. And we wanted to ask about people's lived experience, so without going in with any assumptions about we, what we thought these might be. We were very keen to recruit people from outside of the NHS, so we went to um, support groups locally, um, and various recruitment strategies outside NHS. But we used um, a, an interview which can look at whether people meet criteria for bipolar disorder, and all our participants met criteria for bipolar 1 or 2. And also they were not currently in episode, because obviously when people are feeling elated it may be um, that they report um, lots of positives linked to bipolar, but actually it's a reflection of their current mood. So it was very important that these people were not currently in episode. Um, and we used a methodology called interpreter phenomenological analysis, um, which is really just a, a very uh, complicated way of saying that we talk to people um, about how they experienced bipolar and we tried to make sense of what they said. So we tried to interpret some themes of what was coming out of the data. Um, we carried out 12 interviews in total, um, and then two of them we then had to exclude because actually they were currently in episode, so this doesn't include their data. So in the end we had 10 transcripts, and we did an in-depth analysis of each of these, and we tried to draw out what was common, but also what differed across the participants. And I think it's really important to flag up that we're not attempting to generalise from this study. So this is a small sample of highly selected individuals who were keen to talk about positives. So what we're wanting to do is just find out more about this area and then we can move on to future research which might be around how common it is etc. So we did start off with some initial thoughts um, that I think it's important to share. Our first was that we were very concerned um, that we might offend people by implying that the negatives are not important. So by only asking about the positive aspects um, we, we were keen not to uh, minimise the, the very real negative impact of bipolar disorder. We also thought that positives might well be present, but that they would probably only be linked to hypermanic experiences, because this seems to be what the literature was suggesting. And we also wondered whether actually positives might be swamped by negatives, so that it might be very difficult for people to talk in depth about the positives. Okay, so... Um, so we had a research assistant who at the time was Catherine Taylor who um, introduced herself to the participants including um, her own personal bipolar experiences. She then used um, a topic guided interview um, and essentially asked people 
um, to start by um, what bipolar disorder or whatever the term they used means to them, um, asking them to think about what particular positive aspects they had in mind when they'd responded to the advert to take part in the research, whether they felt they'd learnt anything um, through their experiences, and whether there were things about bipolar disorder that they would miss if they didn't have it. Um, we also asked them the button question, as it's become known. So um, if you could press a button to get rid of your bipolar disorder, would you press it? Okay, so this just this um, slide just shows a little bit about who um, the participants were. Um, so there are 10 participants. Um, we had slightly more males than females. Um, the mean age of the participants was 42. Um, six met criteria for bipolar one disorder, so they had experienced full-blown mania, and four met criteria for bipolar two, so they had experienced hypermania alongside depression. All but two had, had been given a clinical diagnosis in mental health services and were taking medication. Okay, so what did we find? Um, well, just starting with some general reflections, I think the first thing that was interesting was it was very easy to recruit to this study. So people were keen to come and talk to us about the positive aspects of their bipolar. And people had a lot to say and actually commented on um, the, the value of having the opportunity to say it. So um, I've just included some quotes throughout the results section, which are taken directly from the interviews. Um, to show the kinds of things that, that support the conclusions that we've drawn. So this person says, it's nice, but you're not allowed to say that because that's bad insight. You have to say it's all terrible and it isn't. So there's clearly people feel a pressure in clinical services to talk to, that they don't talk about some of the positive things. Um, the, the, the interviews were actually very passionate. People talked about the gift of bipolar and some of the experiences came across as really being very intense um, and and something that I think some of us felt we were missing in not having experienced. Um, but it was very clear that the negatives went very much alongside the positives. So I think this quote, um, it's a two-edged sword because the very gift is also the curse, really captured the sense in which people saw the positives and the negatives as inextricably linked. Okay, so the key themes that we identified um, included um, the direct impact of bipolar experiences on everyday living, um, the idea that people felt lucky to be bipolar and what that was about, and finally the relationship between bipolar and the self. And I'm just going to elaborate on each of these in turn. So starting with the direct impact on everyday experiences, I guess the first one was feeling that um, a kind of intensity and amplification of everyday experiences. So normal perceptions and internal states were present, but to a far greater intensity. So um, if there was a dimmer switch, I think they only operate within about 5% of what 100% would be. Um, and for some people, this actually was, was to the extent where these experiences um, were actually quite psychotic. So one person who wrote uh, novels, said, I'm, I wouldn't even be thinking about demons and witches controlling my thoughts without the psychosis, and this is the foundation of most of my writing. Um, a, a second direct impact on everyday experience was a sense of an ease and an increased ability to do things. So some of the participants um, were high-functioning professionals and talked about how much easier their job was um, in, in certain states that were linked to their bipolar. So I can come up with a solution just like that. It tends to be just right, sort of like gut instinct. Somebody else who talks about writing a book and having it completed in just six weeks and how they would love to get that back. And what was really interesting here was it wasn't just about the hypermanic state. So one of our participants was a vicar um, who talked about how important um, it, his depression had been for him in order to be able to, um, well, as he puts it, enter into the terrible suffering of parents. Um, and these are parents of um, children who died and where he's been taking the funeral. So he felt he, that his experience of depression allowed him um, to do this in a, in a much more empathic way with a, with a greater level of understanding. 
And then um, the last direct impact on everyday experience was this sense of human connectedness. And this was very common across the participants that they felt their bipolar gave them a level of connection with other people that maybe that others didn't have. So more open interactions, um, coming from wanting to share the kind of vibrant feelings and the energy um, that they experienced. So just to sort of keep the good feelings flowing from you to everyone else, like a sort of mass, mass consciousness, really. Um, and, and they also talked about this sense of increased empathy and sensitivity to other people. Um, this participant describes it as sort of like an everyman trait, because you felt like things. You've got more stuff that you've experienced, so you've got more common ground for conversation with people. And I think it can just help you to be more open. OK, so moving on to the second theme, lucky to be bipolar. So what was clear was that people felt that this was actually a gift for which they were extremely grateful. Um, and I think this, this first quote really catches this. So one person says, it's like kissing God, um, or I've just gone blessed. I've been blessed, haven't I? So a quite powerful sense of, of, um, of this being a gift. And so what was underneath that we were interested to explore? And I think what, what seemed to underlie it was an assumption that more is better in terms of life experiences, feeling a range of emotions. So even when these are really distressing, the fact of having been able to experience things at a much greater intensity made people feel like they'd um, kind of done more living, I suppose. And it and, and it wasn't kind of lucky. So people felt that they were lucky rather than morally superior. That's why they felt they'd been given the gift. So they talked about feeling special, but not better or worse, just special in the sense that they're able to experience things. So smelling it, feeling it, touching it, rather than people who are just here. And I guess people who are just here are people who don't have bipolar. Um, and actually, this, for some people, this extended to, the, to a level of almost sympathy for people who didn't have these experiences. And because the, there was a kind of fear of, of normal, which referred to people without bipolar as being very dull. But again, a real emphasis on it's not all good. It's a two-edged sword because the very gift is also a curse. But the gift itself was simply wonderful at times. And then the final theme um, that we pulled out was, was the way people talked about um, bipolar in relation to their sense of self. And actually, um, there were three quite different perspectives that came across the 10 people. And I think this was particularly interesting. So for some people, um, bipolar experiences were seen as being integral to their self. Um, and a, a good quote for this was a guy who said, it runs through me like Blackpool through a stick of rock. And, and this model was able to account for the kind of episodic nature of mood experiences as well. Um, so it, it, just because that, that it's not always present doesn't mean that it isn't always there inside. For other people, the, the, the framework that they were using to understand their experiences was more of a kind of multiple selves framework. So a kind of Jekyll and Hyde um, perspective in which they actually identified um, different selves so this person even has different names for the selves that she's in um, and feels that they're very different people. And then the third model was very much an illness model. Um, so feeling that the, there is a, a me um, and a sense of self and then times when I am ill. Um, so when, when I might appear different, but actually that's when I'm not very well. And I guess it was interesting to think about why people had such different models. And part of this was um, reconciling the idea of illness with such positive experiences. So as one person put it, I've been diagnosed this, but I don't actually believe it. How can you diagnose that somebody who is incredibly effective is actually ill? So that's sort of reconciling um, something that, that feels very positive um, with a, a mental health label. And, and I guess relevant to this was also thinking about the pros and cons of the diagnosis. So some people identified um, clear positives to having a, a diagnosis. So, for example, justifying certain kinds of behavior. 
Um, so this person says it's a great way of dealing with the world, isn't it? But it's kind of good because instead of being a bullshit arsey bastard, now I'm bipolar. So great. So for him, it had been a label that had helped him to um, to justify some of his previous experiences. But then the, the downsides of the diagnosis were also highlighted. So the stigma, so people still feeling that, um, that there's a, a strong stigma associated with that label, although it was recognised that that was definitely um, getting better. So in terms of the, um, the button question, how would you press the button? Three out of the ten people did press the button. So I guess we have to ask um, ourselves why did the others not? So three out of ten people would have got rid of their bipolar. So what, what was different, if anything, about them compared to the rest of the sample? Um, so we explored this and the things that we identified were, first of all, from demographics, they were all male, um, they were not in paid employment, and they all had bipolar disorder one. So they'd all experienced full-blown mania. And that was actually quite important because qualitatively, um, what came out of their, their transcripts was that they had all been very grandiose when they were manic. They'd all been sectioned and they'd all lost their jobs as a direct result. And they talked quite a lot about the loss of control and the sense of shame that came from this. So what was clear was that for some people, um, the experiences were so extreme and had had such devastating um, impacts on their lives that even, you know, despite being able to identify positives, that it still wasn't worth it to experience those. So what conclusions can we draw? Well, first of all, people do want to talk about the positives as well as the negatives, and there were lots of them. Um, people were even more positive than we expected. So some people talked about actively seeking out bipolar experiences, seeing it as a gift, and not wanting to, to get rid of it if they could. Um, it wasn't just hypermania, as we thought it might be. Um, it was actually across the whole range of emotions, so including some of the depressive experiences. I guess thinking about limitations of our research, obviously it's a very small and deliberately biased sample, um, and, and the qualitative method that we use is really about understanding individuals' experiences. So we're not trying to generalise this to, to all people with bipolar disorder, or imply any causality um, in any way. What, what we're doing is really trying to ex, um, explore in depth um, some individual's experiences and see what we can learn from that. And I guess ultimately we're trying to challenge this, so the chronic psychiatric label associated with negative messages of poor outcomes. But I think it's really important that we don't go the other side. What we're not suggesting is that it will always be like this either. So it won't make you a film star or famous. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll write a best-selling book, although people do. Um, and it doesn't mean that people all want to be bipolar. I think it's just that what we're trying to do is to achieve a balanced perspective where we can explore the huge variation in bipolar experiences. And this is important because it allows us to think about what predicts this variation and how can we build on it. Um, this is a, a link to a, a report, the Understanding Bipolar Disorder Report, which expands on some of these ideas. So thinking about our next steps, um, we're really keen to look at how widespread are these positive experiences and what other factors determine whether bipolar has a positive impact for any particular individual. Um, and we're trying to do part, this partly by an online survey, um, which is currently up at this link. So if you'd like to um, take part, that would be great. You can follow the link and tell us about your experiences. Okay, so I think I've talked long enough now. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I have no idea if there's still anybody there. Yeah, can you hear me? Hi, Erin. Hello, that was a beautiful presentation. Thank you so much for for sharing your research findings with us. I remember the first time I heard some elements of this talk was in Morocco at a cognitive behavior conference that we were both at a few months ago. And I knew that it was a topic that would be uh, relished by the wider bipolar community. So it's fantastic to be able to um, to use this, this technology and this webinar technology today to be able to do that. Um, and really important research, you know how much I value research that um, is 
beginning to redress the imbalance in bipolar disorders research more broadly. It's very important, of course, to focus on the negative aspects of the condition and the symptoms and disability and suicide rates, etc., cetera, et cetera, which are associated with the condition for many people. Um, but it's also critical from our perspective to look at the other side of that coin. And the work that Spectrum is doing is uh, really at the forefront of that research internationally. So, so thank you for that. I think the next steps for us here are on that if you like while people are sort of thinking and crystallizing or typing in order to ask their questions uh, but Fiona I was really interested in um, in the methods of how you, how you did this particular study on positive aspects and experiences you mentioned during the presentation that you were using something of what we would call a community-based uh, participatory research or a community engaged method where the person doing the qualitative interviews was actually somebody who had lived experience of bipolar disorder and I just wondered um, after the process if you spoke to her about what her experiences were like as an interview whether she had any um, feedback on the type of um, data that was being gathered or finding in the interviews and whether her own lived experience had any impact on how the how the interviews actually um, ran out and um, yeah. were experienced from her perspective I, I, of what impact that had although I think there are um, there is some research that's been done around this and actually um, there's quite there's quite mixed ideas about um, how useful that is so I think on the plus side um, when people talk about their own experiences, sometimes it can lead participants to feel um, able to be more open. They feel that the person they're talking to will have a better understanding of their experiences, um, maybe feel um, it, that it's less judgmental, um, that kind of thing. Um, I think on the, on, the, on the negative side, I think in terms of collecting qualitative data, um, if you're interviewing, um, if you have a shared understanding of something, quite often it's not um, elaborated um, as in as much depth as if you're explaining an experience to somebody who doesn't understand it very well. So I think a good qualitative experience, um, interviewer will kind of, you know, get the participant to talk in depth about their own experiences and how they make sense of them and, and how... Um, you know their their understanding of why things are happening, and all, and that's almost easier to do if you really don't understand it, because you can genuinely kind of keep probing and keep asking questions. Whereas I think if you actually understand, you have a connection and you do understand quite a lot of those processes. Sometimes those questions don't get asked, um, which for the person then reading the transcript is is more of a problem. Um, so, I, but I think I think in this particular case, Kat was very aware. question I had was uh, well two bits really one is um, you you don't I might have missed it but you haven't that this has generated a degree of controversy I think hasn't it as well as interest mm. um, I wonder if you wanted to comment on why you think it is controversial and also the second bit is how I think some of the uh, clinicians I've certainly worked with would dis, would sort of talk about apparent positives as if there's a difference between an apparent positive and a real positive and how, how would you conceptualize that okay so i think the first bit about the the controversialness um certainly my my biggest worry was that that this would be taken as implying that bipolar disorder is a positive thing and it's a lifestyle choice and those are the kinds of things that have been um, said about some of this work um, which is absolutely not our intention at all and and I understand that you know people who've had their lives completely devastated by bipolar disorder might find the idea of exploring positive aspects just too hard to bear um, because for them it has been a wholly negative experience and a very very painful one um, so even asking the question about positive aspects might um, I can totally understand that for some people might be very difficult um, and and so you know we're, we are really keen to emphasize that that this it, not everybody we're not trying to imply that everybody has positive aspects and we're certainly not trying to minimize um, any of the negative experiences it really is just about opening up um, our eyes really to see the whole 
um, the whole variation in experiences so that we can better understand um, what bipolar is and, and therefore, you know, help people um, to manage it. Um, what was the second bit? <laughs> Well, the the well, second bit was just that, that I've heard some clinicians talk more about, you know, the, uh, about apparent positives or oh, yeah. some kind of conditional word about people's perception of positives. And I wondered what you thought about that. Yeah. So, um, so I guess part of that is about, you know, um, people sort of not really, uh, particularly if people are in a hypermanic mood or in a manic mood, that they might that their mood actually is um, is what's driving their perception that there's a positive. And actually, there are no positives. But because they they're high or they're, a, they're or you know hypermanic, then they'll they'll misinterpret experiences, and that's actually just a symptom of the illness, if you like. Um, so we were really keen to make sure that that people were not in episode when we interviewed them, so that we could make sure that that couldn't be um, a criticism of the um of the research and and i guess that that also stems from a long a long sort of history of interpreting everything that somebody with a mental health problem says as being part of the mental health problem um and hopefully we're moving away from that but i think there is still a kind of a sense in which people's experiences are all interpreted within light of that diagnosis which is why diagnostic labels are so powerful and potentially so damaging Thank you. Webinar would like to ask you follow-up questions. I'm sure you'd be happy to take them via email. Um, it was a really, really excellent presentation. Um, Chris BD is newly branching into webinars. Uh, they offer a wonderful way of sharing information about bipolar disorders research internationally across different time zones um, and really opening up science. Of course, there are lots of bugs in the systems. It takes a while for people to get used to the technology. Um, I can promise you, having done a few of these, it gets easier over time as people learn systems. And um, I do think it's going to be one of the ways forward for us as scientists and for people who care about changing the, uh, the landscape of bipolar disorders research and care. So uh, thank you for joining us. Um, our mission at Crest BD is to share the science of bipolar disorders with you. If there is anything that you can see in our portfolio of research on our website that you would like to hear another webinar on or you would like more outreach on, just let us know and see what we can do. And uh, then it really just remains for me to say a huge thank you to Fiona and uh, to all the participants who joined us today. Uh, thanks for your time and uh, I hope to connect with you again in the future. Thanks for organizing it, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.